Howdy, and welcome to the Preaching Poetry Podcast. The Preaching Poetry Podcast uses poetry to inspire conversation and to rediscover the world. Let's get to it. Welcome back. Uh, Today's poem is going to be How Did You Die by Edmund Vance Cook. Did you tackle the trouble that came your way with a resolute heart and cheerful? Or hide your face from the light of day with a craven soul and fearful? Oh, a trouble's a ton, or a trouble's an ounce, or a trouble's what you make it. And it isn't the fact that you're hurt that counts, but only how did you take it? You are beaten to earth. Well, well, what's that? Come up with a smiling face. It's nothing against you to fall down flat, but to lie there? That's a disgrace. The harder you're thrown, why, the higher you bounce. Be proud of your blackened eye. It isn't the fact that you're licked that counts. It's how did you fight, and why? And though you be done to the death, what then? If you battled the best you could... If you played your part in the world of men, why, the critic will call it good. Death comes with a crawl, or comes with a pounce, and whether he's slow or spry, it isn't the fact that you're dead that counts, but only how did you die. Now, I just want to go ahead and say that in the age of quarantining and COVID-19, I'm not trying to write this poem because I think you should be all that worried about dying. Um, Take proper safety precautions. Do everything you can to keep yourself safe. But I have always enjoyed this poem because of that sort of idea that it's not about what happens to you. It's about how you deal with it. And so uh, before we get too far into the poem, I I just want to say a little bit about the author Edmund Vance Cook was a prolific poet, but I have not been able to find a lot of information about him. I know that he was born in Ontario, Canada on June the 5th, 1866. I know that he first worked in a sewing machine factory, and that in 1893, apparently he left that job to begin a career as a poet, writer, and public speaker. So, just a little bit um, about this guy that, you know, you may um, start working at doing something that you don't really care about, and you may end up doing that for several years, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever. Um, But it's never too late (laughs) to begin to earn your living as a poet or a writer or a public speaker. Um, So there's hope for all of you out there still working towards your dreams. And there's hope for this podcast. It can be a success. And anyway. um, So yeah, Edmund Vance Cook was uh, known as a children's poet. Um, But he wrote at least 16 books of poetry, and some were for children, not all of them, but he was well known as being uh, an accessible poet for children. And so this poem kind of has that feel. It almost feels a little childish with the way that it rumbles and, and rolls off the tongue. But, you know, I, I still I think this is a good poem for everybody. Um, I know that Edmund Vance Cook um, also became a broadcaster on a radio station, WWJ in Detroit. Uh, he would broadcast his poems live to thousands of listeners. It makes me kind of wonder what this guy would be doing if podcasting were a thing. Like, if he was alive now, you know, he might uh, he might be running, you know, he may, he may be the king of poetry podcasts. He may be the king of all the podcasts. I have no idea. But anyway, he, he was a very prolific guy and a skilled and talented writer. And he was well-known and well-published and well-heard by a lot of people. But I just don't know very much about him. So if you can recommend a resource to help me learn a little bit more about Edmund Vance Cook, uh, I would love for you guys to shoot us an email, send us a message on social media. Um, Yeah, let us know. If you know more about Edmund Vance Cook, please feel free to share that information with our community um, because I'm sure there are other people who might like to know. So, Um, The poem that we read is fun. It skews towards that auditory enjoyment. It's lyrical. It's a pretty easy poem to memorize if you want to. It's almost like a song. 
Um, and it may be a worthwhile endeavor out there for some of you who are looking for some inspiration to recite at need or on a whim. Or if you want to impress a date or something, you could just whip out a poem and recite it. I, I don't know, but I would encourage some of you, if you're looking for a little bit of a challenge, and this isn't something like you would normally do, memorize a poem. This would be an easy one to do, um, just because it's because it's like a song. So, anyway, enough about Edmund Vance Cook. Let's talk about the poem itself. Okay. Did you tackle the trouble that came your way with a resolute heart and cheerful? You see, Cook has a very specific idea about how we should be handling trouble, and that's the theme of this first verse. He says we should have a resolute heart. Okay, It echoes the strength of will that comes from poems we've already talked about, like Invictus or If. But it adds an important thing that those poems didn't really talk much about, and that's cheerfulness. Right? With a resolute heart and cheerful. Be of good cheer. There's no reason to simply be this sort of silent, stoic, enduring everything with a drawn face. Like, no. He says, have a resolute heart and cheerful. The cheer makes this poem more childlike, but it also makes it more honest. And it makes it a lot more fun than a sort of cold Victorian masculinity. I like that he says to have a cheerful heart. He goes on to say, you know, or hide your face from the light of day with a craven soul and fearful. So hiding is the opposite of that resolve, of that cheerfulness. Um, If you're cheerful, you're probably not hiding, right? And so a good sport will compete even if you know that you're going to lose. There are people out there who will just quit, who will give up, um, because they're not doing this for fun. They're not out playing the game for fun. They're not out doing things for their in personal enjoyment or to better themselves. They're doing it because they're chasing a win, because they're chasing something bigger than themselves, because they have not learned how to deal with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. But I think that if we can we can tackle the trouble that comes our way with a resolute heart instead of hiding our face and being craven and fearful. I think that we can go into those situations, even when we know we're not likely to to win, even when we know the other guy may be stronger or maybe a better bowler. Yeah, I don't know what it is. But whatever situation you find yourself in, you may not be able to win and be the best at every single thing. But are you still cheerful? Do you still have that resolve to do your best? You see, the craven, cowardly thing to do is to hide from trouble. And it's very unhelpful because you cannot hide from trouble for very long. You see, you can avoid trouble for a little while, but you cannot avoid it altogether. You cannot escape from trouble in its entirety. And so it's better to face it head on. And it's better to keep a resolve and a cheerfulness and essentially a smile on your face, even if you're not necessarily guaranteed success. And I think we can only do that when it's when we're doing things for our own sake, when we know how to treat triumph and disaster as imposters. When we know that success, that failure, that both of those things are not who we are, and they are not our identity. And if you can't If you don't have that idea, if you haven't internalized that concept, you're not going to be able to be cheerful when you lose. He goes on to say, Oh, trouble's a ton, or a trouble's an ounce, or a trouble is what you make it. And it isn't the fact that you're hurt that counts, but only how did you take it. See, it's interesting to think about this. He says, A trouble's a ton, or a trouble's an ounce, because... Really, trouble, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder. So for me, running a mile is trouble. But for some of y'all listening, running a mile is not very troublesome at all. Your circumstances may be different. And there may be some things that would be troublesome for you that would not be troublesome for me. So you see, when he says trouble's a ton or a trouble's an ounce, or a trouble is what you make it, part of 
the stress and the trouble that we deal with on an everyday basis has to do with how do we perceive these things. Now, don't hear me say this. There are some horrible things that happen to people, horrific things, tragic things, PTSD-inducing things. I'm not talking about that. And I don't think that we're at that point in this poem yet. Edmund Vance Cook here is talking about just sort of everyday trouble. And some troubles are going to be small and some troubles are going to be big. But all trouble is essentially what you make of it. And so our circumstances are all different. But how we respond to the trouble that we run into should be the same regardless of our situation and our circumstances. We have to face that trouble head on, like he says, not hide, not attempt to delay it, because trouble is what we make it. Now, I feel like it is also important to say that I don't mean to minimize trouble. I don't mean to say that if you're dealing with some something that's a problem, if you're depressed, if you're anxious, if you're having a hard time, I'm not saying that that you need to be going it alone, that you just need to be more cheerful, that you just need to suck it up. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay, mental health is a complicated and convoluted thing, and I don't think that asking for help is a bad thing. If you're having trouble tackling the things that come your way with a resolute heart and cheerful, well, don't just, you know, knuckle down and try and do it all yourself. No, no. There's nothing wrong with getting help, whether that's from friends, family, from licensed counselors or therapists or a a pastor or a friend, like whoever it might be. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, um, (laughs) that you shouldn't get help if you're having trouble dealing with trouble, so to speak. But what I am saying is that the responsibility is on you. And, and even if, you know, you can't handle it alone. It's your responsibility to figure that out and to do what you have to to learn to cope and deal with things. Because unfortunately, people aren't going to do this for you. And so if you're relying on someone else to come and find you and rescue you, that's not going to solve the problem. Personal victory, even if it's assisted with the help of a therapist or a counselor, all of those things help us build more confidence and they help us overcome our depression and anxiety. Now, I I have to just go ahead and be 100% upfront with you. I am not a mental health professional. I am not trained in any of this. And I may be just talking out one side of my mouth and I might should just shut up. I I don't know. I'm, I'm not trying to cause more problems or more pain and I may be completely off. So if I am, let me know. If I'm overstepping, if I'm causing more harm than help, you know, again, send us an email or a direct message, something. Um, But I do feel that need to say that we have a responsibility to learn how to deal with the trouble and stress that comes our way. And I just want to encourage you that it's not something that you have to do by yourself. Um, that the poem does not say you have to do it alone, but I think sometimes we we sort of revert back to that I am the captain of my fate, or the master of my fate, the captain of my soul mentality. And while I don't think that um, that you have to go it alone, I do think that you will have to be the one who's ultimately responsible for getting the help that you might need. But there's no shame in getting help. Anyway, again, not a doctor. Uh, if I'm way off, let me know. But um, he, he says, you know, if it isn't the fact that you're hurt that counts, but only how did you take it? So the idea here is that we will get hurt eventually. Pain is inevitable. Struggle is inevitable. Life is awful, brutal, nasty, and short. Life is suffering and pain. But what distinguishes us and makes us honorable people is not that we don't have those pains and those sufferings, but it's in how we handle it. Do we let those things destroy us? Do we let those things make us bitter? Do we let those things um, cripple us and, and destroy us and make us weaker, less than? Or do we learn from those experiences and learn how to deal with them? 
You see, how you respond to suffering is far more important than what your suffering actually is. Because remember, what's really trouble troubling for you may not be super troubling for me, and what's really troubling for me may not be super troubling for me. What some of you guys who are listening to this, what some of y'all deal with each and every day would cripple me, would bring me to my knees, and vice versa. But we have to learn how to respond to our situations and our pain. The second stanza, he says, Are you beaten to earth? Well, well. What's that? Come up with a smiling face. It's nothing against you to fall down flat, but to lie there, that's a disgrace. You see, failure should not define us. It should not define our mood or how we react. For us, failure is a detour. We cannot allow it to be our destination. And this is a big deal in our culture because persistence is a dying art. Most people do not stick with something for a very long time. We tend to give up quickly when it gets hard. And we tend to jump from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing. But people who are good at what they do and who are successful, the ones we look up to and want to be like, they are persistent. They don't give up when it gets hard. They don't quit just because it got difficult. They're patient and they're persistent. And so the first part of this, the second stanza there, it reminds me that, you know, it's nothing against you to to fall down flat, but to lie there, that's a disgrace. That reminds me that I should not be looking down on people who fail, who fall down flat. Me personally, I tend to get a little cocky and arrogant. I start comparing myself to other people and looking about how awesome I am compared to them, but that is a bad idea. And that is a character flaw in me. Okay? There is no shame in failure, nor should there be. And if there is, that's just ridiculous. Okay? It should not be that way. But to accept defeat the refusal to better ourselves, the failure to understand that we are on a journey, the failure to take the next step, that is shameful. And that is something that we should not aspire to be. We should continue to move forward towards our goals, even if things get hard and even if we get pushed back against. Because he says here, the harder you're thrown, why the, the higher you bounce. Be proud of your black and eye. It isn't the fact that you're licked that counts. It's how did you fight and why? (laughs) Now, that talk about bouncing, that makes me think of a few different categories for things um, and for people. I was actually talking to some of my uh, gifted and talented students um, about this stuff. Um, One of their the, their GT teachers had sort of created this unit about resilience. Um, and basically we broke things down into a few different categories that some things are hard and tough, right? They don't bend, they don't break, they're difficult to, to mess with, but some things are malleable and flexible, right? Some things will move. And then some things are elastic, right? You may move them, stretch them, bend them, but they bounce back. But the final category there are things that are resilient. And and it's the same for people. Some people are hard and tough. Some people are flexible. Some people are elastic. They bounce back no matter what's happening to them. But what we want to be is resilient. So an example of something resilient, something that gets stronger under pressure, is like a broken bone. Right, So the bone breaks, but when it heals back, it becomes stronger than it was before. It doesn't just return to 100%. It goes up. You know, It's stronger than it used to be. It's the same with muscles. Like when you exercise and you sort of, you know, do those curls and you hit the gym and you get swole, bruh. I mean, when you do that, you break your muscles down, but they come back. They heal and you get stronger. Okay? And so we want to be like that. We want to be resilient. Okay, the harder you're thrown, the higher you bounce, right? So a black guy is not a, a badge. Of, a, a, a black guy is not a badge of shame. It is a badge of honor if we are resilient, because we can learn from them and we can get stronger even in the face of suffering and difficulty. 
if we're not resilient, a black eye is just going to remind us of our defeat, shameful, whatever. And, and, and after a while, they'll heal. And then we'll just forget about it. And we'll never learn the lesson. But resilient people grow. Okay, so everybody gets beaten. Nobody goes undefeated. Nobody bats a thousand for very long. And if you get beaten, ask yourself this. If you lose, if you fail, if you do not have success, was it because you didn't do your best? Or was it in spite of you doing your best? Okay, if you get beaten, was it because you didn't do your best? Or was it in spite of you doing your best? So I think about some of these battles where, you know, things did not go well. Where somebody got beaten, but they gave it their all. Something like Thermopylae, right? Where you have the famous 300 Spartans standing against a massive Persian army. Now, to be fair, they all die. It's not a great example. Um, Or the Alamo. I think I mentioned that one in the episode on Old Ironsides, right? So the Alamo, you have the sort of last stand, nail the colors to the mast, victory or death kind of thing, and and they got defeated. But, But there are a few other examples of this where you got beaten, but in the end, it worked out well for you. And... The one famous battle that I'm thinking of here is called the Battle of Bunker Hill in the Revolutionary War. So the Americans know that they're probably not going to be able to beat the British Army in a one-on-one fight. Okay, They're not a professional army. They're not as well equipped. They don't have as much weapons and supplies and ammunition. And so they wait, you know, hold your fire till you see the whites of their eyes, right? Schoolhouse Rock, you know, hold your fire till you see the whites of their eyes, Oh, yeah, sorry. You had to listen to me sing there. That was not fun. But but in that battle, the Americans lose, but that that defeat actually makes them more resilient. You see, they they can't keep the British off the hill. They do a lot of damage to their enemy and they have to retreat, but they prove to the British that they could stand up to them and that they could hand them a major and devastating casualty count without losing very many of their own. Even though they had to retreat and ultimately lost the battle, in some ways, that was a victory for them. So it wasn't that they got beaten, but what it was instead is that they did the very best they could with what they had, and they proved themselves to themselves. Okay? So... It isn't the fact that you're licked or that you got beaten that counts. It's how did you fight? Did you give it your best? Did you give it your all? Did you try everything and think of everything? Or did you roll over and quit? The last stanza says, And though you be done to death, what then? If you battled the best you could... If you played your part in the world of men, why the critic will call it good. Death comes with a crawl or comes with a pounce, and whether he's slow or spry, it isn't the fact that you're dead that counts, but only how did you die. Now, it seems awfully cavalier for someone talking about death. The tone is a little bit upsetting, or it could be, and yet we see what he's trying to do with this, right? The point he's trying to make is, what did you do with the life that you had? It's not that you died. Okay? But what did you do with the life you had? Right? If you played your part in the world of men, why the critic will call it good. Well, you know, who is the critic? Is it God? Is it some sort of just sort of, you know, history or, you know, how the, the people who read about your life or whatever, who knows? I, I don't know, but it, it calls to mind for me, um, Teddy Roosevelt's speech. So about seven years after Cook writes this poem, uh, um, Teddy Roosevelt gives a speech and I bet you've heard some of this. Um, Teddy Roosevelt says that it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives 
valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. (laughs) I mean, what else do you need to say about that? Definitely fits in with the theme of this poem very well, doesn't it? Um, He says that death comes with a crawl or comes with a pounce, and whether he's slow or spry... It isn't the fact that you're dead that counts, but only how did you die? And it's true. Death comes for all of us eventually. Some people know that their death is imminent for years. Okay, suffering with cancer or chronic disease. Some people have a really slow decline at the end of their life, and you can just see it coming, and it's so slow, but it's inevitable. And some people get hit by a bus, or have a freak accident, or a heart attack, or a stroke. But everybody dies eventually. So it isn't that death is a black mark on your record. It's on everyone's record. Okay, Death is not failure. But what distinguishes us is how do we face death? And how do we live in light of death? Well, now what? Perhaps even more than asking, like Cook does here, how did you die? I'm really concerned, guys, with how did you live? Y'all, this poem is a reminder to embrace failure, pain, defeat, and to respect the fact that we're going to fail, that we're going to lose, that we're going to die, but to respect that rather than to live in fear of it because that fear can be paralyzing. Y'all, every day, all of us, we encounter new opportunities to tackle the trouble that comes our way. We run into new places where we need to bounce back. We find new ways to battle the best we could or to play our part in the world of men. So my encouragement to you as we listen to this poem and say yes and amen, at least I am, you might disagree and that's fine. Um, I don't know what you think. But but I do believe, y'all, that we have opportunities around us all over the place and I don't know what they look like for you. You're going to have to figure that out for yourself. You're going to have to figure that out for yourself. What does it look like for you? I just want to encourage you to take a minute and reflect on that. Where can this poem inspire you to do better, to grow, and to change your world, to change your circumstances and situations, to change your habits and patterns, the way that you handle stress and failure and defeat? Anyway. Thank you for listening to the Preaching Poetry Podcast. I hope that you enjoyed your time with us, and we look forward to having you back for more. If you like what you heard, please be sure to leave a review, and don't forget to subscribe. If you're looking for more content, you can find us on Apple, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, basically anywhere you find podcasts. If you want to join our community, or just want to get in touch with us, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Preaching Poetry. Thank you.